Hello, international! Nice to see you. People keep asking me questions about uh, the science of music theory. So I'm gonna I, I grab a comment that contains a lot of questions about that. I'm gonna answer them before I even start. Though, let me tell you one thing: in order to write music or to play guitar, you don't need to know the science of music theory. You don't need to know all the science behind it and the mathematics and the stuff. You just don't. I know a lot of you out there want to know that and are curious about that, so I'm making this video because after all, I know my music theory really well and teach it. I, I teach music theory for a living after all, and I do have a PhD in physics, I confess, so I'm pretty much the right person to answer those questions, okay? At the same time, nothing of what I say today will make any difference in your music. I'm just telling you immediately right now, if this is something interesting that I'm answering because you guys like it, but it's not gonna make a difference in the way you play, okay? I'm saying this also because if you watch this video and you understand half of it, don't worry. You can still learn your music theory, you can still learn all the music theory you want and write great music. You don't have to understand all this. But hey, it's interesting, so let's go and see that. I have a totally unrelated question. Yes, indeed, as I was saying, it's a totally unrelated question. When we play a note on the guitar or any other instrument, it has bass frequency X, but also other frequencies such as times two, times three, times four, etc., are also still there, but in lower amplitudes compared to the bass. Okay, first thing, it's, as you're gonna see in a moment, exactly what this sentence means, but let me just put this in right now. It's not true that the bass frequency, which technically is the fundamental frequency, not the bass, but it's not true that the fundamental frequency have a larger amplitude than the other frequencies, okay? There are many situations where it's not, okay? Just putting it there because it's not true. Naturally created sound always seems to have this aspect. Okay, so let's start immediately there. It's not a question of naturally created sound or artificially created sound or anything like that. There are two kinds of sounds, okay? That's what physics tell us. There are two kinds of sounds periodic sounds and non-periodic sounds, okay? Periodic sounds are when something repeats several times and it, it usually happens so fast that you can, your ear cannot uh, feel the repetition. It just happens too many times in a second. And non-periodic sound where the sound does not repeat. We call the first kind harmonic sound because when you hear a periodic sound, your ear interprets that as a note with a specific frequency, which is the frequency of repetition of the sound, okay? So for instance, you have something like a waveform, okay? You have something like that, and then the same thing repeats, and I mean, if I were good at that drawing, it would be exactly the same thing repeated several times. Now, if this happens 440 times a second, if uh, this would be one 440th of a second, so this happens 440 times in a second, this will sound like an A note to you, and it will sound like this. And the exact shape of this uh, wave I'm repeating will tell you what is the timbre of the note. Then you have non-periodic sounds, we call them noises in general, because your brain does not interpret that as a note, okay? So this happens when you struck uh, what is called a non-tuned uh, non percussion. So let's say you hit a snare drum, for instance, or you hit, uh, a, 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 you hit, the, you hit the whiteboard or anything else, that's a non-periodic noise, it doesn't sound like a note, it's a noise, okay? This doesn't repeat. The waveform of this doesn't repeat, so it doesn't create a note, okay? If you're following me so far, that's great. Now, what happens is that when you have a periodic sound, so the, no the thing repeats 440 times a second, say, okay, then by a complex mathematical reasons, I'm not gonna go into, into, into it here, but you can find everything you want by studying what is called the Fourier transform. Actually, in this case, the Fourier series. You can go there, you can Google that, and then if you know your math, you have hours of fun. And if you don't know your math, you will have to study three years of math before you can understand that. But if this happens, then you can take your strange wave and rewrite it as one pure wave at the base at, at, at the at the fundamental frequency, another pure wave at twice that frequency, and at this point it starts to be hard for my limited drawing abilities here. Pretty much at that, 
another fundamental, another frequent, another um, wave at three times the frequency. Two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Another fundamental frequency has a four times the frequency. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Pretty much, okay. By changing the amplitude of all those waves, so that is fundamental two times, three times, four times, and summing all of them together, you can obtain any shape here. Okay? Doesn't matter what's the shape here, you can always write as a sum of like putting together all those waves. So if you have enough uh, sine waves, uh, if you have enough uh, of, of those tuning forks, <laughs> each one tuned the right way, and you can modulate the amplitude, you can recreate any kind of timbre. You can make this sound like a violin, like a trumpet, like any other synthesizer sound, okay? And that's what some synthesizers actually do. They directly sum these, okay? A additive generation of sound. Makes sense so far? But this happens only if the sound is periodic, so that you perceive it as a musical note. Otherwise, you cannot do that. If you take a, a bass drum, okay, or something that doesn't sound like a note, or just this, and you cannot do the same thing because you don't have a bass frequency, you don't have a fundamental frequency, so you cannot multiply it, <laughs> and so that, that you need to use something completely different that is called a Fourier transform. Okay, I don't know why the guys decided the one it was a series, one it was a transform. I mean, I know, but those are two very similar names. They should have used something more, more clear on the distinction because people just hear the name Fourier and they think it's the same thing. No, it's two different procedures, very different. That's what creates sound. So yes, everything is made. Everything you play on the guitar, this is just the sum of scene waves, sinusoidal waves, with the right. Um, proportion to create that. And the fundamental one doesn't have to be the one with the biggest amplitude. Okay, indeed, for instance, if you use distortion, it typically isn't. <laughs> okay? If you, if you, if you're playing, I don't know, a violin, a violin or a cello, a big part of getting a good tone out of that is to try to make this wave bigger than the other waves. And when it doesn't happen, when this is not big enough, you are screeching with the bow over the string, and you go, Wing! okay, what's happening is that you're not making the fundamental wave big enough. If you want to have the scientific reason of that, then explaining exactly what you do with your bow, completely different problem. Okay, but what about like tune percussion? What if a drummer is going to tune their bass drum to B flat or something like that? Good question, Camille. So what happens if you have a drum and you tune the drum? Well, you're doing what is called the Fourier transform. We had that before. When you have a Fourier transform, you cannot separate these in frequency one, frequency two, frequency three, but you're using all the frequencies. So you have, that's frequency. Okay, that's amplitude. And you hit the whiteboard. Okay, and what happens is that uh, you look at your EQ, okay, and there is something going like this. Okay, right? But they are not, those are not separated in like the first frequency, the second frequency. Those are you using, you're using now all the frequency. What you're doing when you're tuning the drum is that you are trying to modify the tension of the drum or the diameter or other things so that you get a peak somewhere. So when you hear this noise, it's a noise because you have all those frequency and it goes thump or pang or something like that. But there is also a big component close to a specific note. So you are hearing that as if there was a note hidden in there. Okay? But it's not a real note, it's just a, a, a peak in the spectrum. You notice that if you record this and you use either Logic or Cubase set and you put an EQ, you're gonna see the waveform. Okay, you're gonna see, sorry, the, the frequency. Spectrum, that's what it is. Yeah. The Fourier transform is what takes you from the sound to the frequency spectrum, okay? And you're gonna see a peak somewhere, that's what you are moving. You're trying to move this up or down to find the right note. A note an octave higher would contain frequencies times two, times four, etc. Whoa there! Too fast! Okay, so what is an octave? Okay, that's an interesting thing. An octave is what happens when we have two notes and the frequency of the one is twice the frequency of the other. So, if this guitar is tuning standard tuning, my A at the 12th fret of the 
fifth string, it's at 440 hertz, 440 hertz. My open string is at 220 hertz. Okay, so open string, string 220 hertz. Hertz means vibrations per second. This string goes up and down 220 times in a single second. It's very, very, very fast. At the 12th fret, I have 440 hertz. Exactly twice. I mean, that's assuming that the guitar is absolutely perfect, the string is, is not rigid and all this kind of thing. But let's, let's assume it, okay? For some reason, our ear does not perceive those two things as two different notes, but it perceives it as something of the same at two different levels. While when I play, I don't know, an A and an E, you think those are different notes. When I play an A and an A, you think that those are clearly two different notes, but they, they are related somehow. So that's the same note, higher. Why this happened? This is not a property of the physics. This is, there is nothing in the physics or mathematics of this that tells you that your brain has to perceive things this way. But since you can hear around 10 octaves of sound, if, if you're very young and your ear is perfectly pristine, <laughs> you can hear 10 octaves of sound, it seems like your brain at a certain point evolved or decided that, uh, in, to do something and to make things easier for your brain to, to understand by thinking, A, I'm just repeating the same thing over and over. So that note and that note and, sorry, so that note and that note and that note and that note are the same note at a different level. We call those octaves. Okay? It's like kind of your brain is trying to compress the information rather than thinking that this is a note and that's a completely different note and that's a completely different note. Your brain is trying to make sense of all this big input with different uh, um, octaves and with, with, with a lot of different frequencies by thinking, okay, every time you double the frequency, it's the same note. And for some reason, it seems to make sense to your ear, but Lots of music theory is built on this perception thing, which has nothing to do with the physics of things. There is nothing in the physics that says, this, that says that if you double the note, it's the same note. It's just something that we found out our brain does for some reason. Is it because of the overlap we regard them as the same note? Yeah, it's not a question of overlap. It's just simply that your brain thinks every time you double the frequency, it's the same note. And it doesn't matter if about the overlap of the spectrum. Now, those two notes will have a similar spectrum. What do I mean with that? Well, the low frequency here, 220, so let's say that the bass frequency is 220, okay? So you have the, the, the first note here, the low note, as 220, and then let's say twice that, so 440, and then say three times that, Okay, that, that's zero, okay. Two times that, three times that, so one, two, three, and four times that, and five times that, and six times that. So you have all the frequency, 220, two times is 440, three times is 660, uh, four times is four, uh, eight, 80, etc., etc., okay? The note, the high note, starts at 440, and then it has twice that, which is this, it does not have this, it does not have this. And it has three times that, which is this, and it does not have this. Five, six. So the note at a higher octave has only the even components of the note at a lower octave. So there is an overlap. But the overlap per se doesn't tell you anything on how your ear perceives that with respect to the octaves. Different quantity of those spectra I mean, in, in the spectrum will give you different timbers, but you don't need that. If I had a pure sine wave, so a tuning fork, and then a tuning fork one octave higher, you will still perceive those as a different octaves. And the tuning fork contains only this frequency, or only this frequency, and it won't contain all the other frequencies, at least again, an ideal tuning fork. Makes sense? So, the spectrum has nothing to do with the perception of octaves, as far as we know. 
If music was made with pure sine waves, would we still have the same naming system? Would chord inversions really be considered the same chord? Let me stress you one thing. The naming system has absolutely nothing to do with the physics of it. The idea that we call those notes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, F, G sharps, flats, the idea that we have keys and chords, etc., has practically very, very, very little to do with the physics of things. It's more like what your brain likes to listen to. Okay, uh, this, this is the point where I get people like, yes, but the perfect fifth is exactly 1.5, the frequency of the low one, and the perfect fourth is that, and the major third, and then, the... guys, you've been listening to music composed in the 12 tone equal temperament forever, and all, those, all the notes on the temperament are completely out of tune if you think about simple ratios between the notes. Not only that, but it appears that if you retune the music, and if you take it and put everything in a computer, and let the computer to play only the exact precise interval, so that the fifth is exactly uh, 1.5 the frequency, which is, would be the perfectly tuned, the just fifth, and the major third is exactly the perfectly tuned just major third, etc., etc., then the music feels kind of empty, because at some level we do like that the frequencies are not exactly, exactly, exactly where they should be, and they are slightly out. It kind of gives the music a little bit more of a thickness, of a rub between the notes that wasn't there before. People have made this experiment, and by and large, when you have a blind experiment, okay, so people don't know which is in in tune and which is not, people prefer if the notes are slightly out of tune. It just sounds better, okay? To so just saying that. There's really, you've been listening to major thirds and minor thirds that are horribly out of tune if we think only about the spectrum, okay? And yet, not only that, but sometimes, even if I make them even more out of tune, so if I bend one, one, one note a little, if I just play this, you think it's a major third, even if the major third is here. I can, you can hear a difference if I move the note, but if I just go there, or there, you don't hear much of a difference, right? it sounds exactly the same thing. So, your ear automatically takes the pitches coming in, and goes like, okay, with good approximation, what is this, a major third, a minor third, okay, something in between, and your, your brain pitch corrects everything you hear, okay, that's what people don't understand. That's why it's really hard for a beginner musician to know if they're out of tune or not, because their ear automatically pitches correct everything, and a good part of becoming a good musician is to learn to disable the automatic pitch correction and actually listen and see if you're out of tune or not, okay? So, it's not a question of the content of the spectrum, if those notes conflict with each other, if the spectrum exactly overlap or not, etc., etc. Okay? It's a pure question of what does your brain hear and how does your brain can interpret what you play. Which means that even if you're slightly out of tune, if you're 1% out of tune, on paper all those frequencies goes completely wrong and it should be horrible, but if you're 1% out of tune, most people will barely hear it. Okay, so we are not relying on the perfection of pitches ratio to understand music. Examples like that are plenty when you study musicology. There are plenty of population in the world that use scales or sets of pitches that are completely out of tune with each other if we think about them only in the sense of frequency ratio. There are populations in Africa that use um, five note equal temperament. So they take the octave, they split it in five, the resulting intervals make no sense to a Western ear, and yet if you listen to music made that way, it kind of makes sense, okay? Your brain somehow adapts to that, cannot interpret them in the sense of there are thirds, there are sixths, there are something in between, okay? But somehow it makes sense, and also, even if you play those notes, you cannot play a wrong chord in that system. Any, any combination of notes, even all five of them at the same time, seems to sound good, as the moment your brain adapts to it. So, it's not a question of pitches ratio.